So, all right, and we're recording. I often forget to press record. That is my Achilles. <laughs> um, I'm always on live or something. I'm like, man, I didn't record. So we're going to jump right in. I am Chanel Rose, the host here at the Sign Right Here podcast. And we are here. Okay. How do I introduce you? I don't know if there's like enough time to talk about how awesome you are, <laughs> but I'm going to try. So the first thing you put was from corporate banker to agency owner. And, mm -hmm. you know, that's like a small piece of it. Like agency owner doesn't really like give a full picture of all the amazing things that you've done. But I love that if you were to encapsulate what your pivot was from, you know, working as an employee to being the boss, that is the perfect short and straight to the point um, how you get things done. And I would be remiss if I didn't at least allow you to, first of all, tell people who you are um, mm -hmm. and what you do. And then we'll jump right into our conversation. And it's about your story and hopefully how you can help people with your talents and expertise. Yeah. Oh my gosh. So where do I even start? <laughs> I guess um, long story short was I was in corporate banking realized that after having my babies like or my first baby that I was working like horrendous hours right mm -hmm. and you're getting bonuses for that no you don't and then I after I get home I only literally spent like an hour at most with my kid every day and that was not the life that I wanted to live um and so that I started looking into I guess, highly specialized skills um, that I already had that I could, I'm sorry, highly specialized, I like, sought out skills that were complementary to the skills I already had. That was what I was trying to say. <laughs> and so at the time, Facebook ads were like huge or becoming really, really big. This was in like, 2018 early 2018 so I was like you know what I have a sales and marketing background I've worked with tons of fortune 500 companies at the time so why not go into Facebook ads and it had enough of a how should I say data a numbers and a creative where it kind of appealed to both sides of my brain so I was like okay like this is something I could go into mm -hmm. um, that's how I started and then if you guys know anything about the client journey or businesses in general, Facebook ads is not going to be enough to get clients, right? It's the whole experience that's happening after. How is the landing page? How is the email sequence? How are you um, contacting them? Are you retargeting? Like, how are you kind of giving them the full luxury client experience from the beginning all the way to the end. So that led to me um, also offering like funnels of email marketing as part of my services. And then once that came into place, people were like, oh my gosh, now we have so many clients, but there's no way for us to keep track of our clients, our team, our project management, all of that. And I fell in love with the back end, um, which made sense because I also had an operations background. Right. So um, now it's like a, both a marketing and our operation services for our clients. Okay. Uh, <laughs> You're like, well, right. I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think we've talked a bit and I guess mm -hmm. we didn't say this, but June and I actually worked together. Um, and so it's great for me to be able to like come on a platform and see you in this light. So you talked about something I think is super important. Um, we talked about the client journey, but really what I found to be the most profound is you described what it's like to understand when it's time to take pivots in your business. And I love that you didn't say you were passionate about it. You felt like it was your calling. You said you love doing it, right? But it's not... Mm -hmm. um, the passion. I think especially with a lot of people in their business, they may love the creative part. The back end is not what they enjoy. And so they're trying to chase love and passion inside of things that don't require that. They just require systems, right? Like you and I both um, love systems. I love to set it up once and have it go on and on and on, right? Like I'll put forth the effort to create a sustainable system so that I don't have to do it all the time instead mm -hmm. of having to like 
pick it up and do it all on my own. So if you're somebody who is, I think this is a good point. You said they were starting to feel overwhelmed with the amount of clients they have. What would be like the first piece of advice you give to an agency owner, maybe a single member firm for them, if they're starting to like feel what you were saying, what's the first thing they should do to try to like relieve themselves? Uh, first thing I would do is pinpoint where you are feeling the most overwhelmed when you're getting those clients, right? Is it onboarding them, right? And onboarding in itself is a full system. And I think what most people don't understand is because a lot of people interchangeably use system and processes, but system means there's multiple processes to create that system, right? So an onboarding system will have multiple processes, processes, right? It could be sending out the invoice and the contracting. It could be listing the deliverables that, deliverables that will be part of that whole container with you. It could also mean like sending out a welcome package and all of these things. It's still part of the full onboarding system, but you may not have all those different processes in place. And because you're scrambling every single time, you're like, oh shoot, like I'm so overwhelmed. So first thing I always do is pinpoint where you're feeling overwhelmed in that process, in that system. If it's like multiple processes or if it's just one single process. Right. And then the second thing that I would do is where can I automate it? Because so many people are trying to do it manually saying like, oh my gosh, but it needs that personal touch. It needs that, blah, blah, blah. But like 95% of the time, you could definitely automate it or have someone else do it for you. I love that. So um, one of the things I do when I work with my clients on the agency side, right? So like the consulting agency side, um, when I think about like the gaps in service, you hit the nail on the head. There are two places where people lose a lot of money and it's often in onboarding. Well, onboarding, I feel like people are kind of neutral. I think mm -hmm. it's about the client relationship during the contract and then offboarding, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I'll give you a great example. I have a client who doesn't take advantage. Like they never, they get 100% of what they're owed, but there's often like an extra 50% that's out there that they never capitalize on. So mm -hmm. inside of the relationship, they do like six month contracts. And so I was like, every month, there should be a survey that goes out and says, Hey, yeah. how are things going in your business? What's working well? What isn't working well? How can I support you? Right. This is going to be super important. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so with one of my clients, she is excellent. Like she is lead thought leadership, millions of followers, like just a, a great person. But inside, like on the back end, her client relationship components, they weren't getting the white glove service. I was like, just start asking people, what do you need? How can I service you better? And what she started to find is that a lot of people wanted like video coaching, right? Um, and so I was like, why don't you find somebody who does video coaching and then add them into the fold? And you can either do two things. You can hire them or you can just pay them as for a commission on sales, right? Mm -hmm. You can add this as a service, um, white label it, however you want to see it. And so she was like, I never thought about that. So I connected her with somebody and it's like ballooned her opportunities. So now she's not actually doing that work, you know? And another aspect was people were like, well, um, inside of, again, same thing, like I have issues with like getting people to sign contracts and send them back, right? And so I was like, well, there are systems that you can automate this. So she was having to sit down, she was editing every single contract. She was customizing contracts in a way that just didn't make sense. I mm -hmm. was like, you're trying to protect yourself. I get it. Hire, first of all, hire an attorney, have them create a contract or three for you, right? And then, when you're editing, you're not editing every single piece, right? Streamline your services. So stop like, um, what's the word? Like you're customizing things that like don't make sense in your business. Don't offer things that like you're having to just be so tedious with. And then you can automate it. So now she has a system. She does her contracts. It gets automated. They send it back in. And then that triggers this other, she uses uh, Zapier and that triggers like the rest of her onboarding. So where she used to spend she told me like 20 hours in onboarding. It's now to like an hour because she also, and this is something that I love if you're watching, maybe you can adapt. If you have a system, you can do a video, right? And so uh, with my clients at every stage on the agency side, I'll do a video that says this month, this is what we're focusing on. And I'll walk them through what they can expect that month. And at the end of the video, they are only at the end, are they able to book a call, right? 
And then it's the book their calls for the month because I asked them to book them in advance so we can all be on the same page. And then at the, towards the end of that month, I'll ask them, how are things going? How can you be supported? Do we need to hire somebody? And so now I may have like a $10,000 relationship with somebody. It's ballooned to sometimes $15,000 very easily because I'm able to support them inside of their business and like not just being so short-sighted. So I hear you even saying like you identify in your own business, like, hey, this is how I can help people, right? And then you stretch it beyond that by you starting to add those services for you. So now I'm going to I'm going to pivot back to you and ask you a question. So you've added like all these services in your business. Um, you are an OBM, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you do social media marketing, you do Facebook ads. Do you have a team inside of your business? Yes. Help you? Okay. Definitely. Like, yeah, I will never do all of that on my own. I did in the beginning and it was crazy because I was charging like 500 a month for all of that. I know, insane. And this was back when I first started. And so I don't recommend that at all. I think it was a good learning experience because that's when I was trying, I was figuring out what I actually liked doing, what kind of clients I wanted to work with and so on and so forth. But as an agency owner, you're not only responsible for yourself, but also bringing uh, and you're responsible for paying right your contractors the overhead that's monthly like fixed uh, monthly expenses and also um your business profits right so not only are you paying yourself and your contractors but you need to make sure there's money left over for your business to actually function on which most people forget about and then they're like oh shit where did all the money go it's like okay like let's back up a little bit because you like especially when you start making money in your business Mm -hmm. um, this is like a perfect segue so I can remember when I first started doing consulting this was like years and years and years ago and I got like my first ten thousand dollar contract baby I spent every penny you hear me Mm -hmm. (laughs) like Mm -hmm. every single cent I went on vacation lived high on the hog and I was like oh crap wait so then my next contract I had to hurry up and get it because I had to pay the taxes, right? So then I was like, man, I got this money in my account. I want to spend it, but I can't, right? Because I didn't factor in expenses. I think there are two things that people, maybe three, that inside of their business, people don't consider. And I think this is really important because this can help increase your marketing budget. And you know, the more money you can spend on marketing, the less you have to work, right? Because marketing is systems and processes. So you have to work less. Um, I didn't think about, like you said, the overhead costs. So I thought about how much I wanted to be paid. I thought about paying my staff. I didn't factor in the fact that every month I spent like at the time, like $400 on email because I was using MailChimp, which was super expensive. And the website host that I had, I was paying for it every month. And, you know, Gmail. And I looked up, I had like $400 in expenses that I wasn't accounting for. And I felt discouraged because I wasn't making what I wanted to make. But I had to quickly learn that, I wasn't factoring in all the expenses. And so I was doing it because I wanted to, but between staff and overhead expenses, I was coming up short, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And so when you think about like pricing, and I'm sure you have this with your clients too, I am not a pricing expert, but I do think that as you factor in how much you want to charge, we often think about how much will people pay, right? Like, but think about how much it costs you to provide the service. And if your price doesn't match your cost, uh, first of all, hey to everybody who is watching. If you have any questions, please feel free to drop them in the comments. Uh, we'd be happy to have a chat with you. I'm Chanel Rose. This is June Chang, and we're having a conversation about marketing and hiring people in your business and what that should look like. Um, so when it comes to pricing, you should factor in how much it costs. And I don't think that that's done enough. Now, when you first started hiring, because I feel like this is an area of insecurity for a lot of business owners when you started hiring people to help inside of your business who did you hire first oh my first hire was a social media manager because I hate social media (laughs) which is ironic ironic I know I don't I hate organic social media right because I'm the type that if I feel inspired, I could, I could do like 100 content in like an hour. Not so 
But the thing is for me to keep up with that, right? And I know technically, and this is something I tell my clients too, I can schedule it out. I can do X, Y, and Z, but it was a waste of my time. It was not something I was inspired by. Mm -hmm. I kept on postponing it. I would find everything else to do except for that. And once, because I knew that as soon as I had the money that was coming in, that's the first thing I outsourced. And so for other people, it might not be a social media manager. It might be a administrative assistant, right? It might be a, a tech VA. It might be a, a website designer, right? Something that takes you forever to do or something you just don't like doing. And for me, it was social media. Because <laughs> for admin stuff, like, because I have my own expertise with systems, everything was automated. Like I didn't need an admin, right? So for me, it just made more sense to have a social media manager and stuff. That is so important. Oh, that is so important. Oh, thank you. Rosalie said, this is such a good conversation. Thank you so much. We really appreciate that. Um, you hit the nail on the head. Like, let's say that again. And I'll say it, you said it, you know, mm-hmm. um, they, we're both religious people, but they say wherever two are gathered, right? Um, you can automate administrative tasks. So if you are overwhelmed, exhausted, frustrated, tired, bored, feeling like you're task heavy, automation, administrative, automation of administrative tasks buys you back so much of your time. So um, inside of like Pivot the Profits, one of the things we say is that we can get you back on average about 20 hours a week um, for you and your team. And people are like 20 out, excuse me, 20% of your time, right? And they're like 20% of my time. I'm like, yes. So imagine if you can get a work day back a week, what would you do with that time? And people think it's like, I'm joshing them, but I'm not, right? Because perfect example, um, somebody opts into your freebie, right? Um, a lot of people have them opt into the freebie. They go into this, they end up in a segment, but the segment is actually not real because they just put them in there because they're like, oh, January ad, right? That's their segment, but they end up in the wide pool. So all of a sudden they start getting these emails from you, like they've been in your email list for three months instead of them being in their own little incubator, right? And so one of the things we did was like, okay, if they opted to your freebie, let's do a nurture sequence, right? And then you can offer them a sale. We figure out like what makes the most sense for them. And then eventually they end up in the big pool, but warming them into it, we found a tremendous amount of value Instead of you having to ask them like, hey, June, want to set up a meeting? Hey, June, I know you opted to my freebie. Do you want my $3,000 product? Hey, June, good morning. I noticed that you've been here for a while on my email. I'd love to sell you something, right? Introducing them to you in a way that like feels good. And also I'm a video person, right? So let's, for those of you who don't know, like video is what sells for me. I can write until I, my fingers fall off and I do great with like email marketing and Facebook, but like my bread and butter is video. I show up on video, people respond really positively to it. So that's the space where I'm most comfortable. And so inside of any marketing that I do, I do do the nurture sequence emails, but they often have a video, right? And it's always like, June, I won't, it's too many people. They'll be like, thank you so much for joining my email list. Uh, I love this so much. Inside of our little community, here's what you can expect, blah, 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 right? Like it's a 45 second video. People love it. Everybody watches it. They enroll, they watch it. And so that little personalization has saved me so much time because now I'm not having to be, for example, in June's DM saying, hey, June, thank you so much for joining my email list and being a part of my community, right? Like I've done that, I've done the work and the reward is um, high level, right? Mm-hmm. And so you, the first thing, if you missed it and you're watching the replay or you just hopped on because I see a couple more people are on, the first thing you should outsource is the thing that you like to do the least but needs to get done. And so for me, a lot of that was like the, everyday tasks to having to remind myself email june chain you know dm june chain i don't do that anymore all of that is automated um it's created a tremendous amount of value now a lot of what we talk about is like on this podcast is like how we've pivoted we talked about your pivot from corporate into you know being a full-time entrepreneur and i think one of the things that i respect the most about you is that you are like me you st- you have that that laser focus and you just jump head in and you're like, I could do that, right? Like I can remember we had a session where I was explaining to you how to me- message landlords. You were just like, okay, I'll do it, right? <laughs> and so it was like <laughs> a seamless process. And so I buried it, but like June is one of my um, Airbnb arbitrage clients and 
has just been a superstar through this entire process because she and I are like very, very similar in that you tell me what to do. If you say it works, it works, right? And you literally ran through that Airbnb process. We sat down, it was like, what, a week? If that, before you start, right. like, you got yeses like within a few days. <laughs> like I think I got my first three yeses within 24 hours yeah. of us, our first meeting. Yeah. And then right. when I, yeah, but I mean, that's a story for another day, but <laughs> of course, right. We don't uh-huh. have to get into that. But the point is that like you took action, right. And this is the power of systems because working with June, she came in, she told me what her goals were. I already knew how to work through it. So every time we would meet or we would talk pretty much every time you ask me something, I don't have it, I'll find it. <laughs> right. Like I'm very mm-hmm. resourceful, but it's because the systems that I have that are in place and not just necessarily processes, like very seriously, I have this FAQ. And if you don't have this, this is a cheat code as a coach. I have this FAQ for each type of client, right? And so if you don't ask me, I don't know that you need certain things, like certain things, yes, right? Like I'll tell you about like color or towels. I'll tell you like what platforms to get on, like that kind of thing. But if you don't ask me about insurance, right? I tell you to get insurance. If you don't say what kind, I don't try to like force product on you, for example, right? Like that's your decision. But when you asked me the other day, like, does Red Bull have insurance? I'm like, yes, they do. Here you go, <laughs> right? Like, because I already know, like, it's one of those things that comes up, payment processors. Um, there's a lot of things that happen on the Airbnb side that I literally, on my phone, I have this note because I've tried to put it other places. It doesn't work out well for me. So I have this note. It might be, you know, the least technologically savvy thing. But a lot of times people ask me stuff. I'm like, verbal, boom. Right now, like a verbal section full of random things that people have asked me over the years. Like, but again, you have to get really good at understanding the client needs. Um, and so another thing I want to talk to you about, because I feel like you have said this um quite a bit. And I, you know, I watch your social media content. Like I'm always, you post a video, I watch it, you email, I'm in it. Mm-hmm. Right now, we're in a very weird place on social media. Um, the algorithm by algorithming, right? Mm-hmm. Like we don't really know. Um, I think we have a good idea of how to get in front of the audience we want, but a lot of people are frustrated with reach, right? They're frustrated with Uh how to do, like how to be thought leaders and how to just like grow their brand. And as somebody who is excellent at this, right? Because like social media is where you live. Can you give, I'm gonna ask you another question after this, but can you give like, for people who are struggling to get their reach and they're just like, the algorithm hates me. What's like your best advice for that person? I say, stop worrying about things that you can't control. And I know that you might be like, what the hell does that have to do with anything? But the thing is like a lot of the times people who are blaming the algorithm and I'm guilty of this too, is because your content is too safe. There's no polarizing content. There's nothing. You might call yourself a thought leadership, but there's no actual leadership behind it, right? Um, And I always think of it as like every single content has its uh, purpose. Some of it might be more of a shock value to get more people interested in your engagement and that will jumpstart, right? The algorithm and others is to really have like a deeper sense of who you are and what you have to offer. But at the same time, if you're very bland or vanilla, it's no wonder you're not really getting engagement. It's no wonder you're not getting X, Y, and Z. And and sometimes it may have like the least amount of likes, but behind the scenes, I'm getting so many DMs. I'm getting so many email opt-ins. So you have to really look at every single like key performance index measures to see right. what's actually happening. And you can't be like, oh my gosh, nobody likes me. Like nobody's liking my posts. Like nobody's DMing me. It's like, okay, well, step back and see what's actually happening. Do you have a strategy? Or are you just posting whenever you feel like it, right? So all of that has to do with it. And it's like, be after that, like what's the next step for people? Right. Like after they DM you, like, are you asking them to get on a call? Are you asking them to be on your freebie after their freebie? Is there an email market? And is there a welcome sequence? Are you going to offer something else on top of that? Like there's so many different things that you could do, but most people simply are lazy to not go that far 
or don't have the knowledge to do that in the first place. Yeah. I think you really just lit the fire. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's not, <laughs> <before it. laughs> like here, listen, since we here, let's have this conversation. Um, your content is boring, right? I use this example all the time. So how are you showing up? And I know there's this whole thing about like, oh, how to content, nobody needs that. They're not a DIYer, a lie. Let me yeah. tell you, right? And I've been dying to post this and I haven't, I'll probably make this video today. Um, how to content is an, is like the upper echelon. I'm gonna explain that, right? So I have a client who is a government, right? When I go and pitch them, right? I pitch them, you know what I'm telling them? How I'm going to do it, right? They want to know that my process makes sense for their business, right? Yeah. So when people are on social media all the time saying how to content doesn't work because people aren't do our DIYers, I think that's a very short-sighted group think thing. Like one person said that they got a lot of comments and so you want comments and you said the same thing. But the reality is that that's not true. And you hit the nail on the head. I don't get a lot of um, plays mm -hmm. or like, mm -hmm. yeah, no. But let me tell you what I do get. I, I posted this on Instagram and I'll probably post it here on Facebook as well. People have my DMs from TikTok all the time. One guy was like, I watched your video. It gave me hope because you showed me it could be done, right? And the video he referred to, because I asked him, was like, how to start an Airbnb without owning property. It's a how-to video. I literally give the steps of how it can be done. So I think your how-to content needs to provide a solution. And you're right, people are boring. They show up, they talk to you like this. And their content reads like that, right? Like, bro, you're boring. Like, let's just put it out there, right? Like, the algorithm, like long gone are the days where you're going to get a million followers in a year, right? Mm -hmm. Or 2 million followers in six months. And when you do, I used to work at the bank. Let's have this conversation, honestly. Like we're here, let's do it. I used to work at the bank, okay? And I can distinctly remember there was this influencer who, I'm, from, I'm in Chicago, who was not from Chicago, who was in town, checking her bank account. She had no money, no money, right? And so she was trying to get her overdraft fees refunded. So we're having a quality conversation. And so I was like, well, do you bank somewhere else? Can you transfer the money? Which is a normal question in banking. It's like, can you get the money from somewhere else? She was like, no, this is the only bank that I have, right? I can tell you dozens of times where people sat across the table from me who had a bunch of followers and were dead broke, right? Um, and I use this example for those of you who are here who are struggling, concerned about reaching the algorithm, Kim Kardashian is a perfect example of this. She has, I'm going to look right now. Um, I think she has like 250 million followers, right? And let's see, Kim Kardashian, she has 362 million followers. The last time I heard about how much she was being paid was something like $5 million a post. Do the math, okay? That's, that's, that's like fractional pennies, right? Per follower of how much she's getting paid. If she's making... Five million on a single post to get the reach of 362 million, that's less than a penny, right? That's fractional. You know what? If you were to divide it up in, in, in total per follower, it'd be like statistically insignificant. Like that's what $5 million is compared to the amount of followers. So if she's only making 5 million a post and she has 362 million followers, then like that's crazy. And she's probably, she doesn't do a single post, right? Like it's multiple posts. So it gets even less per follower. So you're concerned about something that is like vanity. Be concerned about like, are people DMing you, right? Are you, what is your call to action? Is it strong, right? Like pivot out of being boring Betty into exciting Emily, right? And like she said, ruffle some feathers. I'll put myself out there, for example. So, you know, I take Ozempic, right? And Ozempic is a hot, hot topic. It's very controversial. People have very strong opinions about it, right? So on TikTok, I posted a video um, about my Ozempic journey, right? Mm -hmm. And it didn't get, I think it got like 800 plays, which is not a lot for TikTok. Do you know how many people stitched that video? It's insane. <laughs> like so many people have stitched that video. And on top of that, I have people in my DMs asking me all kinds of questions. And I've actually converted a woman who was like, I want to talk about Ozempic and Airbnb, which is wild because we had a very honest conversation about the Ozempic. We talked about Airbnb and I've been able to help her find her Airbnb. And I think it's like, it wasn't, I wasn't trying to like lure people for Ozempic. I was just telling them what worked well for me and what didn't. And that's the thing, right? Like I 
try my best in my content to show my personality and you do too right because like mm -hmm. I read your content all the time and your voice and I'm always like this is June and so you attract people so strongly because it's who you are and so my last questions I know we're like I try to keep it at about a half an hour um so you've told them like don't be boring right don't try to yeah. force the algorithm if somebody were thinking about hiring somebody like you right mm -hmm. so you and your company can you as detailed as possible explain, you know, why someone should hire someone who offers your services and what that can do for their business? So I don't work with, typically I don't work with anyone that's making less than 250,000 in their business, but I find that actually it's closer to half a million um, simply because at that point, they're already, they know who their audience is. They're no, they know their offers. They're confident right in who they are and what how they serve um and a lot of the times they're just tired of doing it all or they might have like high team turnover they may have uh everything in their head but they just don't know how to let go of the control right and so those are the types of businesses and business owners that I work extremely extremely well with because they already have their branding and branding is not just visuals. Okay. It's not just fonts and colors, guys. Uh, they might, uh, they have their branding, they have their audience, they have systems and processes, or at least the start of it so that I'm not starting from ground zero because mm -hmm. what most people don't realize is when there's a whole new platform or system that a co corporation has to incorporate, that takes the minimum of six months to a year, yes. right? But a lot of times when it comes to these small businesses, they expect that to be done within like 24 hours. And now I'm like, girl, right. <laughs> think about what you're asking for. It's like you're asking for a complete rewiring of your business and that cannot be done in like one day or whatever. The strategy might be done, the plan might be done, but the actual execution and for, for the retraining of your team members to follow the same process, it's going to take a really, really, really long time. Yes. Mm -hmm. So that is perfectly said. Um, <laughs> so I, I will piggyback with that. Um, one of the things that I do whenever I work with people is so like in terms of value, I don't really do new businesses. The only exception to new business is if you are not a new business owner, right? Yeah. Um, I think that's an important distinction. So most of my Airbnb clients, especially my one-on-one, -on -one, I don't take any one-on-one -on -one clients who aren't already successful business owners, period. Like I don't. And the reason for that is, is that I used to, and I think the shift happened where I realized like there's an extra layer of like confidence, security, um, and understanding that like I need you to have so that when, when we meet, I'm like, hey, you should do this. You're like, all right, I'll do this, right? And then you're seamlessly rolling through your process. It just takes less time, right? Yeah. For the consulting side, um, most of my clients almost entirely are stuck at like 750 to a million. So one of my clients is an attorney. He's been making 742, 748, 751. Like the past five years, he's been stuck at 750. Um, he's hired paralegals and he's like physically stuck, right? He's like, I need to make it to a million. I feel like I can. One of, the, one of the first things we do is we audit the business. And I tell them up front, like, this is not a, a month thing. This can take two months. This can take three months, depending on what we're dealing with. And it may take up to a year before you have the business that you desire. That doesn't mean that you won't get your time back. It doesn't mean you won't make more money. It literally just means, like, I don't know what the gaps in your process is. And so my systems make money for you only mm -hmm. if we can figure out, like, where the gaps are and then like, where the growth is. And yeah. you want both of those things to happen at the same time. And it, it's impossible, right? Because if I don't know, I'm walking down the street, right? I, and I'm trying to like pave. I can't just be throwing down concrete. I got to figure out there's a hole. Then I can pave it. Then I can keep going, right? And like with that one client who was stuck at 750, he's already on pace to make a million this year. And it's in doing large part to like, again, asking his staff, like, what do they want to do? What do they do well? understanding like their output they had no they had no crm so mm -hmm. this is an attorney 
who was making seven hundred fifty a year. They had no CRM at all. So they had like their client files, obviously organized, they respecting privacy, following the law to the letter. They had mm -hmm. no CRM. I was like, how do you protect your client experience? Like, where is that happening? And I asked him, I was like, what is the luxury experience that your clients get mm -hmm. when they work with you? He never answered. Yeah. Like, go ahead. What are you going to say something? I mean I think it's kind of like what you said in the in the back end, uh, back, a little back is about like the clients trust themselves. They're like self, they're just leading themselves, right? Because right. this is how I say it. I do not want a codependent client, Ooh. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's like, that's toxic as F, right? Because <laughs> I want someone who say, hey, like this is what I know and this is what I need help at and this is why I'm hiring you. And they still have good control and the responsibility and the authority of their business, but they are consulting with you. They're asking you for some co-creation, which right. is completely different than codependency, right? So that on top of me setting those expectations and being like, hey, like, welcome. I send them a welcoming package, like um, a full on onboarding process where it's seamless and I'm making sure that they are taken care of, right? With like what you said, um, monthly feedback or quarterly feedback or like right. making sure that their expectations are being met because you may think that you may be clear as F, right? right? But when you ask them to repeat it back, the way that they heard is could be completely different. So right. I always make sure that expectations are met at both sides or at least where they could come to a compromise. Right. So that we are able to have this smooth relationship that will lead to further like services or even referrals. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. important. The client experience it has to be um, top, top notch. And we stress that, but you'd be surprised how many um, single member attorney firms and doctor's offices that do not, and I want to make sure I say this correctly, they care about the service delivery that they just aren't so focused on the back end and they don't understand the power of that. And so like now, for example, he when he onboards clients, there's like a series of things that needs to happen, right? Like he needs to gather information, that he needs to be able to like absorb that in a certain way. So we've developed almost like a foolproof, boom, 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 right? And so you pay, you get your contract, it sits back out to you, you get this thing, this uh, questionnaire you have to fill out. And then from there, it tells you it takes 72 hours for it to be reviewed. At the end of 72 hours, then it says three business days. Then you'll receive on that fourth day uh, email telling you when to set up your appointment or if we need more information, right? So like at every turn, like communication strategy is set up and it is just like a, a seamless experience for the client. And so it also protects you because if you try to ever go back and say, oh, somebody did or didn't say something, um, I think that it just creates security and trust for you and the client um so i don't know i didn't ask you this but are you like accepting new clients right now yeah so for my marketing side i do have about three spots available and on my operation side i have only one spot so i'm very very picky with who i work with i actually had four people apply but i rejected them based on like it was I don't most of them wasn't like a personality issue I would say is where they were at in their business it just didn't make sense for them to come on board so I put them into a lower package instead uh but yeah because I'm I'm not gonna sell you something you don't need right <laughs> yeah that makes perfect sense well for me um if you're looking to work with me I am accepting new clients I have a new um, group coaching program. I love group coaching. And what I have found, especially for busy people, and I've been testing this out on the Airbnb side for about six months. And the success rate has been incredible with people being able to come in, ask questions, take instruction, and do what they need to do in their business. So I do have a group coaching program called Pivot Think Tank. And it's really designed for people who are looking to increase the value in their business but the goal is really to work less and earn more. And so inside of that system, it's all of the value that I give for like the government contracts that I have and, and the school systems that I've worked with and even like bigger companies. And it's like put down so that, and you said this too, like the same thing that big corporations get, they're getting that exact same experience. So they're able to decide 
what they do need immediately, but then also how they can pivot to the next point. And I have found that like, not a mastermind, but literally just actual group coaching. And I like to call it a think tank because it is like a sharing of ideas and the goal is to take action. And I have found that like, not only as like a coach and a consultant, I like take action advice. I like take action experiences. I'm not somebody who needs a bunch of like, fruit fruit stuff like let's come together let's work let's chat but let's do this to help ourselves make money and like systems that sell are always going to be where i am happiest um and so you've talked a bit about like the type of uh you talked about revenue for how much people can make to work with you um is there like a sweet spot in the market do you prefer coaches consultants attorneys i don't know construction workers what do you mean sweet spot like is there like a type of client that you typically work with is it coaches consultants mm, I want to say it typical on um, the operation side it tends to be more service-based like online service-based um, businesses whether it's coaching or service providers uh on my marketing side it's it's literally anyone mm-hmm. and you no know, people are like well you need a niche down and whatever 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 but I'm on the side where niching down doesn't necessarily mean the industry, but the type of people that I work with, right? Um, because the people that I worked, I worked, I worked with a laundromat, I worked with a dog breeder, I worked with a multi seven figure right. coach, yeah, like I worked with, um, I don't know who else did I work with. I worked with a boudoir, but a photographer right so like it doesn't matter I feel in terms of the marketing because it's going to be the same essentially um wherever you are in the industry Mm -hmm. um but on the operation side I do have like a minimum requirement for revenue just because financially like package wise it doesn't make sense for them to pay it and to do all the things that I uh, are required for to be in that package. That makes perfect sense. Mm-hmm. Um, so for me, um, typically you are the right fit to work with me. Again, I've said this before, I'll say it again. If you are successful in your career, so I, I work a lot with C-suite, like you have to have a mass success somewhere in, in your life. Um, and the reason for that is that my programs require confidence because they require taking action immediately. And there's not a lot of negotiating against that piece. So you got to come in ready to work, right? And I have found that like, if you're frustrated, tired, um, feeling like you're not making enough money, you're going to take action, right? You're going to do what's necessary to see the results. And I work well. I have a ton of attorney clients. Um, I have a, that's really attorneys, consultants, doctors. That is like, my sweet spot in the market. I don't know how I, well, I do know I worked in politics. So that's where the attorneys come from. I'm sure. Um, but professional services is my sweet spot. And I need to mention this. I don't work with physical product businesses. Um, for lots of reasons, the primary reason is that it's much more cumbersome. And so my process is four steps and I am just not somebody who wants to add, you know, in the audit process, having to negotiate against like physical products cost and like to get into those weeds. So if you're looking for a physical product person and you're trying to pivot your, your revenue, I am not the best fit for your business. But if you if you are a service-based business, nonprofits, I work with nonprofits quite a bit because uh, of my fundraising background. All of those are going to be a great fit for me, um, but not physical products. So Miss June, thank you so much for joining me today. This was fun. I think this is the longest one I've had so far. <laughs> um, <laughs> I appreciate taking the time to speak with me. I will as always, uploads this to YouTube and all of the, what is a podcast platforms. So you will be hearing from me again soon. I have another one coming up on Thursday. Uh, I appreciate you. If you, I always like to let you guys close out. If you have anything that you would like to say to end us out, uh, feel free. Uh, well, thank you for having me, Chanel, for, you know, inviting me on your podcast and your, on your show. So I'm, always happy to chat I feel like we always chat about like everything <laughs> we do. We do. So, I, I don't I don't feel like it was any different to have it like I guess broadcasted to the world <laughs> um, but yeah if I'm happy to hop on a call or DM me if you have any questions about my services 
and I will not pitch to you or sell you anything. If anything, I might try to put you off to someone else if I feel like they are a better fit because I am of the opinion that whoever's for me will stay and whoever's not is going to go. So very, very open and transparent about that. So yeah, look forward to connecting with all of y'all. And if you do have, I also do have two freebies, one for operations and one for Facebook ad, Facebook ads. If you go to uh, my profile, the link in bio is right there. So you could automatically opt in. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much for offering your freebie. Oh, and where can they find you? Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn? I, even though I do have a LinkedIn profile, I'm rarely on that. So it's probably outdated for like two years, to be honest with you. So yeah, find me on Facebook or on Instagram, June J. Chang, and I will chat with you guys soon. All right. Well, thank you so much, June. And for everybody else, thank you for watching. If you're watching the replay, please hashtag replay. If you have any questions, please always drop them in the comments. I check them out. If they're for me, I'll obviously answer. If they're for June, I'll make sure she answers. It's been a pleasure, you guys. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.